Okay, so uh, let me begin. Uh, so there were a few problems that I asked you guys to try out. Did you try? Yes? So, okay, so good. So I'm sure you will try it. I'm sure, I mean, it's very busy days, so I understand. But please, when you find time, do try them. Okay, and I'll put up these notes and partial solutions to help you. But I'll do that in a day or two. Okay? Okay. So uh, let me just uh, say what I did yesterday. So I tried to show you that there are these various evolutionary processes or let's call them forces, natural selection, mutation, random genetic drift, and some broad thing called population structure. Right? So yesterday we discussed what happens if I have no evolutionary forces. Then I discussed what happens if I have only selection, only mutation. And then I said, yeah, let's make things like our life a little bit more complicated. And I asked you to think about what happens if I have both mutation and selection. So I think Luca will say a bit more about that today. So you have till 2 o'clock to think about the answer to that question. So I'll leave you with that and uh, start the new topic, which is about random genetic drift, which I said to you yesterday is about stochastic evolution. OK? So let's start. Okay, so when I did the uh, problems yesterday, when we wrote down the simple recursion relations, I'm implicitly assuming that I have this bacterial colony which has infinite resources. Okay, so you know, you put in your petri dish as many bacteria as you like, and there's enough food for all of them to survive. So that's why there were no fluctuations, and we could just work with this X1, which stands for mean frequency. So I did not stress that yesterday, but uh, I'll do that today. I'll repeat that bit today again. But of course, in reality, the population, there's a finite amount of resources. That means a, only a finite population can be sustained. So I want to introduce a term. The size of the population is finite. Okay. okay, so let me just give you an example. Again, haploid asexuals like yesterday. So I have, let's say, these five guys. Uh, these are, uh, they denote some bacteria, let's say. So these are these five guys, and I have this food for these five guys to survive. Now bacteria will replicate. So we got this. Let's say no mutations. Now there are 10 of them. But you say there is food only for five. Somebody has to die. That means half of the population has to die. Right? So this thing, the death process, I'll implement stochastically. That means I'll throw a dice. And maybe this is the unlucky guy. He did not get enough food. And the others rushed and got it. How did the others rush to get the food? They were fitter. Maybe they were, you know, bacteria, I don't know. They, were more better, they, had, they had better mobility or some better way to uh, compete, right? So maybe this one died. Uh, this one died out of these, these ones, this one, and maybe this one, or this also. Oh, sorry, so let's keep this guy. Okay, okay so, so the point I'm trying to make here is that if I want to keep the size of the population to be finite, to be fixed, I want to keep exactly n particles, n individuals, then I'll sample this population stochastically. Which one dies, which one remains, that is chosen probabilistically. Okay, how? That probability of sampling depends upon the fitness. So the probability that one of them is, this one, uh, uh, let's say, dies and this one doesn't, so that depends upon the fitness. Okay. So let me just say this a bit more, uh, more clearly. So the point I'm trying to make again here is that we have a certain population of size n, we want to maintain it, and we do that via stochastic sampling. But that's how I want to implement stochasticity here. And I'll define this process. 
which does so, called the right Fisher process. So I have here two steps. You know, I had started with n particles, made them to n, and then I have to make some of them die. But let me now define a more standard thing called right Fisher process, which works this way. Okay, so we start with these five individuals. So n here is five. So this is my parent generation T. Instead of making them to n and make some of them die, I will do it in a slightly different way so that the computational time is uh, not too much. Let me just finish it and come to your question. So how would I simulate this process? So I'll, let me explain that. So what I'll do is, I'll say this is my offspring generation. This offspring could have any of these as a parent, right? Okay. So let's say the fitness of this A1 is W1. Okay, I'm using a different symbols like okay, like yesterday F1, F2. So any of this could be parent. It will choose a parent with a probability proportional to the fitness of the parent. So this guy chooses this A1 to be a parent with a probability proportional to F2. Is this okay? Wait just one second. I'll, I'll come to you in a second. And then you just repeat this process. So this guy also, it could choose this as a parent to the probability F1 by 4F1 plus F2. So this guy, throws a dice with the probability f1 by 4 f1 plus f2. This is chosen with the same probability. This could be chosen. This is chosen with probability f2 by the same normalization and so on. Right? So let's say this one also happens to choose this as the parent. And then I just fill in these boxes. Okay, because sometimes it gets a little time to get used to this. Is the process clear? Yeah? Because I'm going to use this several times. So if it's not clear, please ask me now. Yeah, you had a question. Like yesterday, this is a genotype, haploid genotype. I'm just talking about some haploid genotype. I just gave an example to say, that I have a finite carrying capacity. That's what I wanted to motivate to say why I want to keep finite population because I have finite resources. So if I ask you to simulate it, could you do it? Is it okay, clear how to do it? We throw these numbers according to the fitnesses. And if this is chosen with the probability this, this is chosen with the probability F2 by and so on. Yeah? <laughs> yes or no? <laughs> yeah? Everybody clear? Okay, so I'll ask you a question. Okay, so this was without, uh, so I implemented here genetic drift and selection. It's easy to implement mutations as well. So if let's say A1 and A2 mutate into each other with say, same probability, then before, yeah, sorry. The probability that this A1 is chosen to be parent is this. Same is true for this. So any of these A1s are chosen with this probability. Yeah, so any A1 is chosen would be four times of this you have an offspring, okay, you throw a dice, maybe this can have two offspring, like here. So then I have to first let them have more than n offspring, and then kill some of them. It's just a computational, you know, it's better computationally to think it that way. That's all. 
form a new generation, yeah? If F1 is larger than F2, is that what you're saying? Yeah, okay, right, yeah. Suppose the, the fitness is the same, because I have more A1s, yes, it would be more likely to have that population. That's right, but there's a non-zero probability, because it's a dice, right? There's a non-zero probability that maybe all of them happen to choose A2. Why not? No zero probability of that. This probability is finite with n is finite. So this is what I was referring to yesterday. That if I run such a process, there's a non-zero probability, and what that is, I'll come to in a minute. There's a non-zero probability that all of them could be of the same type. So that's not a change due to mutation. It's because of sampling, right? This is possible. A small probability, but for finite n, it's finite. This is possible. And similarly for a ones, right? And when such a thing happens, if I find up after some generations, not in one generation, it will happen eventually. You know, there's a stochastic sampling. So maybe, uh, like uh, you mentioned, maybe I'll get several A's. So what can happen is something like this. Let's look at some. So maybe I happen to find a new generation of this guy. In T plus 2, you know, fortunes changed. I got this. And then, yeah, why not? T plus 10, I find this. So it's not in one generation. It can happen, but eventually, this sort of stuff can happen if I have no mutations. So it could be all A2s or all A1s. If such a thing happens, I say that A2 has been fixed. So I was thinking if I got it right, I can ask in the first step itself, what's the probability that I'll get A1? That's 4F1 divided by the normalization. Then I can ask uh, in a toss of 5, what's the probability that I'll... So I can... I'm coming to that. Oh, yes, indeed. So these numbers are binomially distributed. You heard about that yesterday and today. I'll come to that in, in a minute. Is this okay with everyone? With fixation? Let's just include mutations to that and then I'll come to what you're saying. Okay? So, you could also include mutations in this process. So, let's draw these arrows again. So, each in, parent can have two offspring, but each offspring also, of course, has single parent, right? So, therefore, this has one arrow out, this also has one arrow out. That's possible. And then before I call it t plus 1, I could also implement mutation. So you throw a coin with mu, it could become a2, or with 1 minus mu, it remains a1, and so on. So that's how you can form a new generation. Right? Yes, please. Okay, now let's do that, yeah. So, probability, first A1 is chosen. That's equal to The offspring is chosen as parent at random. So random is each of them. You go sequentially. Yeah. So this guy goes and says, who's my parent? It throws. Let's say F1 was all same, equal probable. Let's say F1 is equal to F2 equal to 1. Right? So this guy could have this as a parent with probability 1 by 5. 
one by five, one by five, one by five, one by five. And then I throw my random number and see, okay, this one is my parent, and that's the arrow I'm drawing. Yes, yeah, but this is the same probability. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, but any of them could be, so this guy has any A1 as a parent, is 4 F1 by normalization. First A1 would be this probability. Generation, although very small. So uh, a parent will not divide into two daughters, can divide into any number of daughters. Yeah. So here, it's not even this bacteria thing. You can have as many, you can, you know, has oh, as many offspring as you like. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So since you all want to get to this uh, binomial distribution, let me explain that. Okay. So, but I strongly recommend you guys to try and simulate it. There is not, no better way to learn something than actually doing it. So many of you are familiar with simulation techniques. So please simulate it, play with these parameters, and uh, perhaps that would help a lot. Okay. So. So let me just answer the question that you guys are asking. Let me ask about this problem, this probability. Suppose I had, in the previous generation, I had I A ones in the generation P. Then I get J A ones in P plus one. What is that probability? Right. So if a1 is chosen with this probability, any A1 chosen with probability x1, oh sorry, p1, and A2 with the probability p2, then what is this distribution? Heads and tails. Think of A1s as heads, and I'm getting a certain number of heads or tails, right? This is nothing but the offspring number, the total number of offspring of A1, that's binomially distributed. Okay? Because this is chosen from P1, P1, P2, etc. and so on. Does it answer your question? Is that what you are after? P1 is that, yeah. When is I plus J no? So I had I A1s. So I had N minus I A1s initially. And now I has N minus J A1s. So number of A1 plus A2 is my Sorry, I'm sorry. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right okay. Yeah. So this object is binomially distributed. So think of A1 and A2 if you like as heads and tails. So this is your familiar binomial distribution. But let me point out, it's somewhat different from the usual thing in which you toss your heads and tails by let's say probability half or some constant P and Q. Here, P1 is going to change with time. Why? Because this P1 is equal to the fitness, um, sorry, is equal to as so in, uh, in, in generation T, this is my P1, right? That's how I choose any of the A1s can be chosen. No, I. Sorry. Right. Okay. Yeah. So any of them can be chosen, but then as uh, time evolves, I becomes J, and then the P1 will become F1 divided by F1J plus and minus I5 FJ, and so on. Okay. P1 is function of I. Yeah. 
then P1 would be, no, so this P1 is, uh, I, don't know, I think I have P1 I. No, there is an I. Because this is the probability of choosing any A1. Yeah, so this is any A1. So this is not the same. I'm sorry about this. Uh, it's called P1 hat. Yeah, yeah. No, this is this is the different P1, sorry. So this is, let's call it P1 tilde for each of them. So then I will be 0, P1, 0, and then that's that's fine. Sure. Okay? Okay, good. Okay, so I'm saying this is the probability of choosing that particular A1. That's this. But this is any A1. And that's where it's scaled by the factor I. So this is, so here I'm not, I don't care whether this is the parent, this specific one is this. Here I'm saying two groups, I A1s and N minus I A2. And that's why you have this permutation factor as well. Right? So I'm not saying the first one is the head. I have, you know, 10 heads and 12 tails. I don't care which order, etc. And that's why the probability, since it doesn't matter which one, that's why it's scaled. It's, uh, you know, upscaled by factor i. And as he pointed out, indeed, if I had no i's, I'll get a zero, right? That, that's, that's correct. Yeah? Mm. Yes, so that, that's P1, yes, yeah, so as opposed to this, yeah, but when I'm doing simulation, that's right, yeah, but I, yeah, but when I'm doing simulation, I have to draw these arrows, who is my parent, etc., and that's important because you will discuss something called genealogy, at that time you want to know who is my parent, okay, so that's why I wanted to draw these arrows as well, okay. But yes, these are the somewhat slightly different things, but you know, yeah, okay. Okay, so, so by now, you guys are very familiar with binomial distribution and its moments, etc. And I can just quickly give you the answer. Okay, so what is the mean of this binomial distribution? By now, you all are like experts, right? Tell me. N times P1, which is equal to? Average fraction equals you recognize this this equation? We saw this yesterday, right? Here, yeah. so yesterday what we did was deterministic theory. I did not say that that X1 stands for average frequency, but you see by the sampling, the mean is what is being captured by deterministic theories. Okay, when we're talking deterministic theory, we are now ignoring fluctuations, all right? So this is what we got yesterday. I did not put this sign, but that's what I meant yesterday. Okay? Variance, how much is it for binomial distribution? Come on, come on. Good, and therefore, this variance at time t plus one is equal to, so this is the variance in the number, and this is the variance I'm saying in frequency, that's equal to, so this is this divided by n squared, because variance, When I have an infinitely large population, which is unrealistic, right? Let's take that limit anyway. Then the variance is zero. And that's my deterministic theory. Okay? I'm ignoring those fluctuations. So that's what we discussed yesterday. And all I have to deal with is this guy. But when n is finite, I have a non zero fluctuation, a certain uh, width 
in the distribution of the offspring. Okay, so that's where the stochasticity comes into play, and that's where this sigma square is going to play a role. Okay, so the key point I want to make with this little example is when you have finite population, there are non zero fluctuations, or the decrease, the decrease as order 1 by root n. Okay, right? Whereas for infinitely large populations, you could ignore them. And this little, these two uh, equations that I wrote down, they are very useful to set up certain equations called Kolmogorov equations. Will you do it? Do you? Yeah, I think uh, Vijay will do that. So they can be set up. I won't do that. So these two equations will be useful to set up some Fokker Planck or Kolmogorov equations. So I won't do that, but and in this literature, when you deal with these kind of equations, this is called diffusion theory. So it's a little confusing to physicists, but you know, that's what is called in this literature. Okay. So if I had mutations, uh, this would be just the same as what we did yesterday. This uh, probability expression would change a bit. Okay. 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 So let's investigate this effect of random genetic drift. It's a little, it takes me a while to figure it out. So let's go a little slowly. It's fine. Um, and uh, but let's investigate a bit further. Okay. So, like yesterday, I'm going to consider the case when there's no mutation, no selection, just random genetic drift. What does it do? Let's isolate it. This just this uh, process and see what it leads to. So when I have what is called neutral case, there's no selection, that's called neutral. In that case, from here you see that x1 at t plus 1. By the way, uh, that uh, angular brackets, it means average over such stochastic trajectories. Okay? So that's equal to, because f1 is equal to f2, is nothing but x1 at time t. Right? That's what we saw there. The neutral case. Okay, so this is saying the average frequency of a1 in time t plus 1, given that I start with exactly x1 of them at time t, that average frequency remains the same. You see what I'm saying? So I'm saying that I start with i a1s, exactly i a1s, and I'm going to say i a2, and then I run this right Fisher process. Is one stochastic trajectory. Maybe I got this time i plus 1 a1s. In another trajectory, I got maybe i plus 10 a1s, and so on. Average over all of that to find that frequency, that is equal to x1. That is i by n for the neutral case. Okay? Yeah? Okay? So therefore, f yeah, this is neutral. F1 equals F2. So, what about average X1T? Yeah, T minus 1, and so on. So, if I started at T equal to 0 with X1 at, you know, X1, 0. So if I start my right Fisher process with this population, which is fixed, it follows yeah. and the individual trajectories. In each simulation, usually that will be different. What is realized? So those individual trajectories are they of any interest, or like I mean, uh, this is some. You could ask for the distribution of a1s at time t. And I think Luca will show that. Yeah, at least he'll give the expression, right? That is known exactly within that diffusion theory limit. That's known, right? So I'll just do simple moments and all that. But you will see some 
more interesting stuff later on. Okay, so this fine, people? Okay. Okay. So I'm saying this you agree because you agree that there's a binomial distribution. But let me ask the same thing. Instead of t plus 1, if I I'd ask what's the average fraction at time t, given that there was x1 at t minus 1, it will be the same. Right? And so on, you iterate till 0 time. So therefore, all of them have to be equal and equal to x1, 0. So this, this angular bracket means averaging all, all stochastic trajectories. Okay? So, so what? So therefore, now, let me simulate this process, neutral case, and I do E such, let's say I find that I started with some x10, and so this is the frequency of a1 at t equal to 0, and I watch it, watch it, watch it for a long time, and I find all have become a1, right, and let's say that happens in even experiments, and in rest of them, t minus even experiments, everybody has become a t. So this result, this result tells me that the fraction of a ones at large times make sense. Yes, yeah. No mutations. No, at t going to infinity, no. And once, so these are the absorbing states. Once you get there, you cannot get out. But if you continue, one of them will be reached. Okay. Yeah? So this is okay with people. This average, this is the definition of average frequency of A1s, right? My definition, because in these even experiments, I got the frequency one, and these ones are zero, and they're for this, right? Yeah. Yeah. Let me come to the fixation. Let's give me a minute. Let me just finish the story. Huh? Okay. Okay. So this is equal to even by e. But what is even by e? It's the number of experiments in which everybody became a one divided by total number of experiments. Again, you learned yesterday in Vijay's lecture. That's the probability all A1s, by basic definition of probability, all A1s eventually. Right? This is what is called fixation probability for the neutral case. And it's equal to this. I said that, you know, there are two possibilities. There are two uh, possibilities as either all A1s or all A2s. So then you have to ask, in how many cases would I get all E1s? So the cases or the probability that I get all A1s is the fixation probability of A1. And that by this two-line calculation shows me is equal to the initial frequency of A1s that I started with. So there's a simple result. Fixation probability of A1 in the neutral case is simply equal to the initial frequency of A1s. What's the fixation probability of A2? 1 minus that, right? Okay, because I just either use this or that. Okay, this is a very basic, simple result, and I want to use this, so uh, please note it. Yeah, yeah. Two boundaries, so two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. So you have to say which one, and that's the probability, right? Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. But the probabilities are changing every instant. So that's why it's different. Okay. Right. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, as the previous question asked, is the there is only two possibility, only getting A1 on A2. I just want to confirm from the previous lecture that you gave yesterday. From that equation, that x1 equal to 0 and x1 equal to 1, 
if that comes as my fixed point. First, I have to check if that is stable or not. If that is stable, only then that will be the outcome. These are also stable. So if you just, okay. I reach all A1s and you put one A2, there's a small chance. So, so okay. So suppose I started with this initial condition. So that's my small perturbation. So I started at t equal to minus 1, all A1s, and I produced this perturbation. I'm saying eventually all will become A1, but there's a chance of that. That's n minus 1 by n. Not always. It will become all A2 with a probability 1 by n. Uh, yeah, I'm that telling that x1 equal to 0 and 1. Both should be stable. All uh, stable fixed point. But I mean, uh, I don't know. Does one do that? Yeah. Okay. Rafa Duka. <laughs> okay. Okay. So what have we learned? So what is the genetic drift doing? We said yesterday selection it destroys variation, and I stress variation is very very important. We need variability. We need variation, right? Selection destroys variation because the good one was perpetuated. Everybody became the same type. Then we introduced mutations, saying that have ah, evolved variability, so therefore, uh, so that there is some variation. What is genetic drift doing? What's the you know simple phenomenon or simple answer that we get because genetic drift? Eventually, that's also just destroying the variability, right? All have become A ones or A twos, but there's a certain chance for that. That's all. Genetic drift also destroys variability, right? So that's a simple moral here, okay? We want variation, so let me now consider the case when I have drift and mutation. So while I'm erasing, think about what would happen. What do you think will happen when I have this model? No selection, A1 is as good as A2, but now I also allow A1 and A2 uh, to become different. What do you think will happen? Think about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You can't get out, yes. Yes, yeah. yeah, but that's what the demonstration was that what's the probability? And that, yes, you reach it. Yeah. In fact, uh, yeah, I, did, I erased it. Okay, but never mind. But basically, this probability distribution would tell you well, from the binomial that J A1's probability of becoming all N A1's is non zero. That's what I was saying here. Yeah, so, yeah. But I mean, so, but that's important result still. But what, what is this probability of reaching one of that absorbing state? Okay, so what do you think? If I have mutation and drift. Okay, you think we'll always reach all A1s? There's a mutation, right? A1 will become A2. All A1s, I have all A1s, but mutations are allowed now. So A1 can become A2, and maybe lots of A2s appeared. It can become A1 and so on, right? So we expect a non-trivial steady state. That is, there will be an equilibrium, drift mutation balance. Drift would tend to destroy variability. Mutation would try to create it. And these two forces could balance out, and we might have a non-trivial steady state. <coughs> Okay, let's do this. Okay. So in this context, so to, I want to calculate a certain quantity. What is this variability that is maintained due to drift and mutation? So for that, I need to introduce to you what is called infinite Elias model, where the calculation is simple. Let me question first. So 
How much variability? The idea here is, so see, I have been uh, discussing this so far, what is called a bi-allelic model. I said there are two types, A1 or A2, right? But I mean, why? There is this A1, which is the sequence, and I said, yeah, let me not look at what's inside this large region, and let me just call it whole big chunk as A1. Let's look inside. Let's say that locus has some L sites in it. And L is, let's say, 500 or so. And uh, it's made of these four nucleotides. So how many sequences could I have? How many sequences are possible? Go to the power 500. That's like, how much? 10 to the power 30 or something? 300, sorry. So, the infinite alias model is the one which says that, yeah, okay, so don't think of the whole chunk as one, just locus A1. Each sequence is an allele. So, if I have a sequence like this, A, A, that's one allele. This is another allele, and so on. They're 10 for 300 for a 500 nucleotide site uh, sequence. So they are, for practical purposes, basically infinite alleles. So this I'll call as allele A1, this is allele A2, and so on. Instead of just saying A1 and A2, they're A to the power A, 10 to the power 300, and so on. Right? Okay. But now, since we have started looking inside, we're not just looking at some chunk. Let's look at the nucleotide. And if I look at it more carefully, one winds up with what is called an infinite sites model. Which is saying that L is not 500, it's infinite. So, four nucleotides? Four. Nucleotides. It is easy. So, so the reason I'm saying all this is the following. So I want to look at now these nucleotides, and they're very important because they are useful when you're handling data. So let's look at these nucleotides, and like, assume it's not 500, it's really very large. Now, if a mutation occurs to this sequence, to this sequence, because it's such a long sequence all the way from there to there, the probability, so I, let's say T became G, the chance that G becomes T back what do you think? Is it like one by two, one by three, how much? So T became G with the probability mu, but the very same G gets chosen and becomes T back. That's of the order of one by L, right? And I'm saying L is infinity, so that's practically, you know, uh, not possible. So the reason for these two models is that we're going to assume at least for the purposes of this little calculation, that whenever a mutation occurs, it occurs at a different site. So whenever a mutation occurs, I get a totally new sequence. Every time, each mutation produces an entirely new sequence. because of these two related models. So that's a sort of point I wanted to make here. If you look at this nucleotide, the, the catching the same guy, mutating it back, that's impossible. I mean, it's, it's just not practically you know, possible. OK, so once I have this model, I want to write down a slightly uh, different recursion relation. Let's go through this. So let's say this probability, each of them is some mu. So just bear with me. 
we'll get to some conclusion. But let's start by considering the following probability. Consider this probability GT, which is the probability that if I have this population of size n, I pick any two individuals at random, like he and you, one or two of you, right? Two random chosen sequences. identical sequence at time t. So for some reason I want to do this and I'll uh, and there's a practical relevance to this. So please uh, you know uh, stay with me. Okay? So I want to do this guy. I want to write down a recursion relation for this. Okay. So I have these two sequences at time t plus 1. have identical sequences. So everybody is 80, 80, 80, this one, that's it, and so is this one. Okay? And let's think of right fisher type process. So the probability mm -hmm. that at time t plus 1, these are two identical, that could happen if in the previous generation, they had the parent who has the same sequence, right? And it should not mutate, because I said, Every mutation produced a new sequence, right? So no mutation should occur. What's the chance that this is chosen to be parent of these two guys? Probability that this chooses, chooses let's say this guy as a parent is 1 by n. We wrote somewhere there for neutral case, all are equally likely to be chosen. This also chooses the same parent, S1 by N. This parent is as good as you know any of them. We don't care which sequence is specifically. So it's also a factor of N. Plus another term in which this could happen. So they chose different parents. These two parents were identical in the previous generation with certain probability GT. And uh, again, no mutation should happen. And this possibility is 1 by, no, so that's equal to 1 by n for this. And this guy should not choose the same parent, so n minus 1 by n into, into the same factor of n. I, uh, this is actually elementary. It looks a lot because you have been listening to me for one hour, but it's not difficult, I assure you. So please do think about it and work out. If you have questions, please feel free to ask me later. Okay? So therefore, we have this simple relation, recursion relation. So just put everything together. Okay. And in the equilibrium, GT plus 1 is same as GP. That's the meaning of our equilibrium. So therefore, if you stress solve this equation, then 1 minus g star equals h star. It's a symbol which is used in books. That's why I'm using it. Turns out to be a small mu. Okay, this is the result I wanted to really derive. It's saying that at large times, if I work with this infinite alleles model, which is very more, which is much, much more realistic than what I was saying earlier about two alleles, then probability that I choose two sequences at large times, any time, 
because this is t equal to infinity, right? Probability that they have different sequences is this much. Okay? This is a measure of variability. There is variation in this population. It's the probability that two individuals have different sequences. This is a famous result, and it especially becomes you know more known if I just neglect this term, saying this is an object to be just two enemy, saying this is much smaller, etc. Okay, a star equals two enemy. It has a special symbol reserved for it. One sec. Given by theta. Again, you'll see it in books. If you like it, you use the symbol, uh, but you'll see it in books. So that's why I'm introducing it. Okay. So this x star equals theta is a measure of nucleotide diversity in a population. I want to make a few remarks here because it's very useful. Yeah, Kishan. Uh, the factor one minus mu whole square mm -hmm. that is coming from the two nucleo uh, two nucleotide. Uh, but, yeah, it's a total probability. But, but I'm assuming only one mutation. Yeah, but I'm asking that is there any constant that the parents from which they are generated, they should also not be under mutation. Means if the parents is also under mutation. Everybody, all the whole population is under mutation. Uh, I'm just um, maybe I'm not I cannot phrase the question. For example, I'm telling you are you are telling that the offspring T plus one generation they should not be under mutation. They're not under mutation. I'm saying mutation is a stochastic process also, right? Yeah. What I and say. So maybe so if to contribute to this term, no mutation should occur when this one reproduces. And it should occur here. Okay, that is the thing from where one minus mu square comes. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Right. okay, so let me make a bunch of points here because you will hear again later. Okay. So let me, uh, these are the points. First of all, so we have this composite parameter. So I had these two things, right? Mutation and drift. This is a quantity which is measured in experiments. I'll demonstrate that how. First thing we notice is that this answer depends upon not on n alone or mu alone, it depends upon this composite parameter. You're going to see this expression again, I think, in uh, Lynch's lectures and several others. So, box it. So that is very useful because what it says is that if, so typically people will talk about it like this. So, I mean, even I did that. I said, take n to be infinity. Then you have a deterministic problem. It is not infinity, of course. I mean, you know, it's a finite population always. But what this tells me is that when I say population is large, large compared to a scale, right? So if n mu is much, much larger than 1 or population size, it's much, much larger than 1 by mu. Mu is of the order of 10 to minus 6, minus 11, depending upon what you're looking at. Then my deterministic theory is good. Okay. So this is something which comes out also from the diffusion theory. In fact, diffusion theory, that's what it assumes. n goes to infinity, and mu goes to 0, such that this composite parameter is finite. That's how these uh, Fock applying equations are formulated. Okay, so here I've tried to demonstrate it using this rather simple uh, equation. Okay, on the other hand, if n is much, much smaller than 1 by mu, then you better worry about stochasticity. Okay, so in this case, we say that if n is much more smaller than 1 by mu, drift is more important, and therefore variability is small. So I should write 2 h, right? So the variability is small because 2 and mu is smaller than 1. So variability is small because drift is important. We just learned that drift is destroying variability, right? So if population size is smaller than a scale, which is 1 by mu, 
variability is small. This is some uh, small model I wanted to give for this part. Okay. Um, yeah. So this can be actually measured from simple data. I'll give you as an exercise. Please try it. So this is taken from some lectures that Brian Charlesworth gave here. So I have the following sequence data. Okay. So I have these five individuals. And there's a long sequence. Wherever these five individuals have same nucleotide, I'm not going to write it. Wherever they're different, I'm going to write those positions. So I have something like this. Okay. So I have this data. I got this data. Okay. So dot dot it means the, whatever is the nucleotide here is the same at all the other guys as well. It's a very long sequence. But here in this position they're different, in this position they're different, and so on. Okay. So if I picked the first and fourth individual at random, probability that the sequences are different is let's say the sequences of uh, length 500. Suppose I picked up the first and fourth individual. What's the chance that they're different? They're different in two positions. The probability is 2 by 500. Right? So my G, I'm sorry, H, would be 2 by 500 if I had picked first and the fourth one. But now you could look at this data and start comparing first and second, first and third, first and fourth, first and fifth, and so on. So basically, this guy tells you that you do this pairwise differences you figure out, add them up, and average it over all this data. That is the empirical measure of this H star. Since I know that from data, so I'm not, I don't have to do experiments in time. I just have to sequence my you know, sequences, a few individuals. I'll get this data. I can measure this variability. And then that allows me to find this parameter n times mu. You can numerically, you can experimentally determine this population genetic parameter theta or n mu. So that's how uh, it is done. Okay. Okay. The example? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, I don't know. It's okay. I mean, okay. So I'm just saying that I have just five individuals which I put from this room and I sequence, sequence some part of the chromosome. Okay, some DNA sequence, and dot 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 means they are same everywhere. So this guy also has zero, 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 and so on. Mm -hmm. This guy seems to have A, and this guy at this locus, at this position is T. So I'm putting a zero here and a one here. And this also A, A, A. That's what I denote here. Now I'm asking, what's the chance? What's the, so if I have this sample, what is the variability in this population? Assuming that there is no selection. So I'll calculate that, saying, find out the pairwise differences in this. That's 1 by 500. This and this, like 1 by 500 again. These two is like 2 by 500, and so on. And average it over all these 10 pairs. Right? So I'm doing this averaging over these five individuals. And assuming neutral theory is OK, I get, uh, I uh, infer, therefore, this population genetic parameter. If I can measure, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yes, that's right. Because that means the sequences are different. That's what my H was. H, yeah. Yeah. So, yes. Hmm. Of two, yeah, the two two individuals. Hmm. Hmm. 
they have different sequences, yes. Right. Right. Uh, in this example, um, all of them are the same, right? Same mother, yeah. Right? Yeah. And okay. that's why I chose them. Because, you know, otherwise, I mean, I could have a sequence, sixth individual, which has same. But then I'll compare with somebody else. So, so what is, uh, how is that, uh, you know, formulated H is So, H is the probability that if I chose, suppose I had just two guys, first and fourth. You don't give me the other data. So the probability that first and fourth are different, for that the H would be 2 by 500. So this is now at the level, so I'm dividing by 500 because I'm also averaging for each site. Yeah, but, uh, no, but I think once you have talked about alleles, looking at sites as well because that's the argument used 4 to the power 500. So, you know, might as well look at the nucleotide, otherwise it's a waste of uh, information. I mean, that actually is a good approximation when I neglect this term. So till here is infinite alleles and if I further assume mutation small, this becomes a good approximation for infinite sites model. Yeah. Infinitely long sequence. Yeah. The way uh, the search function? What function? Cells. I don't know. I don't know in a biology, sorry. I'm asking if there is a threshold above which the, the, the mutation, if, above which if the mutation happens, the function, the, the, uh, the, the principal function of cells can Yeah, so there change. is some threshold in which you can't even think of it as a species. So species means like we are sort of similar, right? Our genome is sort of similar to a large extent, right? If mutation rates are very high, we will be very, very different. So the concept of species itself is problematic. And again, listen to Luca today after me. Okay? Yes. Uh, the, the the way it is defined that if I take any two individual allele arbitrarily, mm. that they are different. That is the probability. And when we are doing in that problem, uh, we are taking two nucleotides, yeah, but not two allele differently. I mean, uh, can, I mean, I think it it is an okay approximation. I mean, if you just average it over each site, both will be same. Yeah, that's the assumption here. Okay. Maybe you shouldn't even think of infinite alleles. Because, you know, when I'm, I'm telling you that there are infinite alleles, I am looking at the infinite sites. I'm looking at a lot of sites. Maybe it's best to just think of it as the infinite sites model directly. Okay? Okay, so I wanted to... <laughs> okay, I, I won't get to recombination, it looks like. But okay, it's fine. Uh, let's continue with this a bit more. Okay. Um, right. So somebody was asking that, you know, from one generation to another generation, suppose I have a neutral case, and again I had mutation, of course the frequency of A1 would change from generation to generation. But here we saw that at last times, I have actually a non-trivial distribution. So there's a steady state, right? I wrote H star. So there'll be a non-trivial frequency of A1 stars, uh, non -trivial, uh, frequency of A1s, right? So I wanted to just give you an idea about what is that distribution. And uh, let's see how we do that. Okay, so I'm not doing the calculation, but I just wanted to argue about this qualitatively. Okay, so the first lesson that we learned is that the answers depend upon this composite parameter to n, right? So as I said already, if 2 and mu is much, much larger than 1, think of large populations. So what do you think? At large times, the distribution would x1 be like. So from what we have learned yesterday, could you guess how this would look? 
similarly, if 2 and mu is much less than 1, that's like saying uh, mu goes to 0. Think of that. Then how would p of x1 look like? From what we have just learned. So I just want you to put things together a bit. If population was infinitely large, what happened yesterday? If population size is very large, no selection, only mutation, what happened? What was the average frequency? Up, right? We wrote that yesterday, right? Mu by mu plus mu, right? So just mutations, A1 can become A2, A2 can become A1. I'm back to bilinear quantity, by the way. Okay, A1 to A2, A2 to A1. Population size is very large, I can ignore drift. And therefore, I expect this distribution to be peaked around half. Do you agree with me? Something like this, does it look okay? If n has become large and large, it will just be peaked at half, like we learned yesterday. Right? On the other hand, if mu is zero, then what happens? Bad drawing. I'll give you the expression in a minute. Yeah, come guys, I've been talking a lot, now it's time for you to talk. Tell me, what do you think this distribution would look like? Huh? Uh, so same as whether, just with drift, how would it look? What happens when there was no mutation, just drift? What was the steady state like? Huh? Fixed states, it's fixed states, right? So n is not, you know, mu is not zero, it's some small thing. So therefore I expect there will be a lot of weight at zero and one, right? Okay, with your intuition, right? Okay, so this is what you learn when you, you know, box the problem separately and then try to put them together. So if you have learned something in these lectures, we should have, we should be able to guess this, and which you have done. But this is just a qualitative thing, and actually, if you use this diffusion theory, answer is known. It's p of x one. The proportionality constant turns out to be this. again the same parameter 2 and mu, right? If 2 and mu is larger than 1, I'm here. If 2 and mu is less than 1, this is the distribution. If 2 and mu equal to 1, you cross, distribution goes like this to this. Have you seen this distribution? Oh, that's why I was asking that question. So this is our famous beta distribution. Okay. So this factor I have here, it could be less than one also, or larger. It's positive, but it could be, it flips this kind of shape, right? So people again measure this thing, and whether it's like U-shape, and there are other complications, or of this sort, that again tells you something about the nature of this parameter n. Okay? Okay. Um, yeah, so, okay, let me just stick with this and finish up this uh, little thing. Okay. Let's continue a bit more about this drift case. And now I want to ask something a little different. So I did not talk about Selection. Now let me turn off the mutation. And I have only drift and selection. Okay, so the question here is the following. I have this A1, which is, has a fitness um, of one equals one plus S, S could be positive, 
negative or even zero. Okay, and the fitness of this A2 allele is one. Sorry, that's one million. Right? No mutations. Again, I have a finite population of size n. So I'm just doing this usual right Fisher process as I introduced earlier. And then now this time A1, if S is positive, is more likely to be chosen than A2. And I just run this program. What do you think will happen at large times? What would be the, is it a, I, mean, what, I don't know, you tell me. What do you think will happen this time? No mutations, selection is there. Who will get fixed A1? Suppose S is positive. So A1 is better. And I, uh, yeah. A1 will get fixed. So he's claiming that if I start with set of A1 and A2, run this right Fisher process, you choose A1 with a slightly larger chance than A2. Okay, and just run this program, then everybody will become A1. Is that right? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> what about A2? Can A2 become fixed? Yes, you're right. A1 can become fixed. What about A2? The poor deleterious mutation. Or is it always the good guys win? What's your experience in life? You might be a good guy, but you have to be lucky. Right? So, the point here is that there is a2, although it's a deleterious mutation, it has a lower fitness. In a finite population, there is a chance that everybody becomes A2. Okay, so therefore I have to worry about the same question about fixation probability. So what is this pi with selection now? I, mean, I don't have a simple intuitive argument for this like we did for that case, neutral case. Uh, you have to work out this diffusion theory calculation. Okay, so I'll just give you an answer. So this pi, this selection turns out to be so once again just like for drift and mutation, we saw this composite parameter to a mu. I have this time this composite parameter to an s. Right. Okay. So in this last uh, few minutes, let's just uh, uh, look at what these, what are the limits, etc., of these uh, cases. Let's take the case of s positive. Okay. Okay. Let's take s to be zero. So then what happens? Let's put S equal to zero if you like. What is this case? Have we discussed it? We have, right? Neutral case. So we expect phi to be same as the initial frequency, right? Is this what we are getting from here? Yeah. Non-biologists, please show me that. Is it true? From here? Yeah. No, I don't think mutation, I mean, I. I'm not aware of that kind of picture though. No. And these are two independent processes. I mean, mutation is something separate, something else, selection is something else. Right? Okay. Six minutes, seven minutes, please. Is this true? Is this expression correct? Work it out for me, please. Huh? The next one, yeah. Or that zero by zero, some school level thing we learn, no? 
the orbital rule or something, something, right? So indeed, s equal to zero. That's true. So s positive. I have two cases. Two n s is much much larger than one, and this. When if this is so, two n s is much much larger than one. So n is pretty large. Right, but s is a tiny number. It's like ten to the minus three, ten to the minus four, or so. Right. So then you can expand this equation again, and this pi is two um, ten s. Okay. The population size is pretty large, larger than one by two s. Yet the a one, which is better, does not get fixed with probability one. Right. So what it's saying is that if I have a finite population, even if it's a very large population, I have to be infinitely better to, you know, win over the rest. Okay. So whenever I have finite population, I have only a finite probability of winning the game, even if I am better. Okay. So that's this one. And in this case, uh, again, you should get the answer to be pi neutral. Please check it quickly. S negative, which is a deleterious mutation. What's the chance that A1 would fix? Okay, just, just use what you think intuitively, right? You know, uh, what do you think? Is it a one? Huh? Okay. Very low, yeah, very low. How low? It's exponentially small. Just with the usual intuition uh, that a deleterious mutation would get fixed, uh, would have a very low chance of fixing, but it has a non zero chance of fixation. Okay? Similarly, beneficial mutation, even if it has beneficial, it may not get fixed. There's only a finite probability of that. Okay, this is a famous formula uh, due to Kimura because he uses using diffusion theory. Um, okay. Yeah, okay, let, let me just do one last bit here. Okay. Let's go to this deterministic case. I wrote down this little formula that I have only selection, no drift, then the frequency of x1 at time t uh, goes like this, right? We did this yesterday. Suppose I'm given, so this is the deterministic answer, right? Suppose I'm given that initially I have, I have finite population, I have just one mutant of the A1 type. So all, everybody was A2, and then A1 arises at some time zero, so that x10 is 1 by n. I want you to try in this uh, two, three minutes, the time for which, during which the x1 will go from 1 by n to let's say 1 minus 1 by n. Could you get this for me? You just have to you know, put in Little to be to be capital T and just work it out. How much is it? Yeah, assuming deterministically, yeah. It it gives roughly the correct answer. So let's just do that. In principle, you should do it using diffusion theory as the correct procedure. But here it turns out to be right, uh, almost right answer. So let's just use this. Can you work out and tell me quickly? Yeah, that's it. So this will tell you the time for this rare mutant to get fixed, almost there. And as you know, it has reached some large frequency, 0 0.9 if you don't like 1 minus 1 by n.
2 by s log n minus 1 by log n. Oh, so n is largest, not you know, so log n. Hmm? Good. Okay, so this is the time to fix. But now, of course, you know, you should ask that, you know, you're using a deterministic expression. But uh, we just learned that even if a mutant is better, in most cases, that is 1 minus these cases, it will just get lost, right? So there is, uh, you know, elaborate theory for other problems. But here's a little point. If I make this uh, assumption that I want this to be get fixed contingent on that it does not get lost due to stochasticity, then I want this guy to be order 1. So I should start with x10 not to be 1 by n, but of the order of 1 by 2ns. I'm saying if I just start with a single mutant, right, even if it's better, it'll get lost. But to take care of the fact that, you know, let me now look at a subset of those trajectories that do uh, go to fixation, they don't get lost due to drift, then I should have this fixation probability to be order one, that is half or one fourth, whatever it is. Therefore, I should have not start with one by n, but one by ns. So if you just repeat this calculation, you will get a slightly better answer for fixation time. So it's like log and all that, but it's useful to keep this in mind because it matters in certain situations. Okay, so I was hoping to do more, but okay. Um, so I'll just stop here, I guess. Yeah? Uh, the particular drift plus selection, mm -hmm. that picture, and going to the fixation probability expression there, uh, we already have seen how to see selection, the, cap the parameter S is playing the role of selection here smallest but i want to know how the drift or random drift is coming in picture and how we can see this in the expression uh, it's coming to n n is finite through n yeah the drift is about having finite population that's what you try to say right when you calculate the variance in the frequency it was going like one by n right so if n is finite i have a fluctuation in the distribution of offspring so sometimes once in a while everybody could get fixed i mean one of the types could get fixed N is a parameter for taking care of stochasticity. It's a stochastic sampling. Uh, and uh, second thing is the time of fixation that you uh, just just saw in the last two, three minutes. Yeah. Uh, fixation uh, can give me the idea to what allele it will get fixed in time. But how this time of fixation is important and why it is important in physics or whatever biology, whatever. Yes. No, you want to know how long it would take for one of them to get fixed. It's not enough to say, yeah, I say eventually it will get fixed. Finite n, what does it mean by infinite? What does it mean by eventual? Right? No eventual, there's no infinite time. There's a finite time for a finite population. And I'm saying that time is of that order. So the order of log n s by s. When we have selection. Can I say a population taking a small time to get fixed more fitter than a population getting long time to get fixed? Operation with lower advantage would take longer to get fixed, yes. Yeah, okay. It would happen, yes. Okay. But these logs are not important. Uh, they appear in other pictures, so when you see them, you know where it's coming from. Yeah? Maybe, maybe this makes it a bit clear. So you said you have to be infinitely better yeah. in order to get fixed with probability one. Right. Yeah. Now, is that similar to you have to start with a whole population of a single allele in order to stay fixed? Um, so, I'm saying that selection can be thought of as a mutation. And I, I think that clarifies it a, li a little bit. You know, so if you have if you have mutations, then one rate of mutation has to be infinitely larger than the other. So, 
so that so that you don't really get into the other side, you know? So okay, so uh, I'm not sure if I'm understand I understand your question, but uh, but you know you could also have now go next step and have drift and selection and mutation. What do you think will happen then? I want to consider mutation as a separate process, and let's put all three of them. Then what will happen? Drift we try to hetero you know homogenize the population. Selection will do the same. Mutation is trying to spread it around. Now these are these three forces you have at play. What do you think P of x1 is? Answer is known. Okay. But try to plot it in the same way and see if what picture that you have in mind it jars with it. Mutation is a separate process, and I, that's how I would think it. Yeah. Uh, the, the, again, the word variability. I was just confused there. I was just asking. Uh, first, I will request you to give an example how to calculate it in a particular simple case. Uh, uh, no, that I, I I don't know, but I could not understand that way particular part. And the second thing is, is that same with heterozygosity term that is used in? Uh, That's another measure of diversity. Okay. Yeah, oh. but uh, the formula is somewhat different. Okay. Okay. That's like x1 into one minus x x1 expression yeah. of that. It's okay. like that variance that I, I mentioned. E x1. Okay. There yeah, are several measures, depending upon what you can measure in experiment. You look at that. There are different statistics people use, different tests they use, uh, depending on what you can you know, measure. Yeah? Okay, I couldn't do the combination at all. Okay.